All right, welcome. This is uh, the uh, DSD lecture for Wednesday, uh, the 16th of September. Um, one week from today, we will have the test. Uh, we'll flash up the uh, syllabus here real briefly. Um, so you can see here we are on the 16th. We're continuing the review of logic design, and we'll have that finished up. Uh, we'll have Friday and then Monday and then the following uh, Wednesday, a week from today, we'll have the test on logic design. Make sure you're ready to turn homework for on Monday. Okay, and I think that's that. Um, let's see, I think that's really it. Let me just uh, pick up where we left off. And uh, I'll shrink myself down here a little bit so you can still see me. Something like this. Yeah, and maybe go up here. All right, so we ended on the Queen and McCluskey method. Uh, I'm not gonna really talk about that. Uh, Y'all should remember this. Uh, basically, you list uh, you list all the min terms by order of how many ones they have, and then you start grouping them. And if you use them, you check them off, and you create a new column of all the ones that uh, were paired together. In this case, there were no individual terms. They all got used. So we checked them all off, and we had all these uh, paired terms. And then we combined these, and we got these. Uh, so these had two boxes connected. These had four boxes connected. And then these always have redundant terms. So you cross out the redundant terms, and you put the remaining uh, unique terms on the chart. The, the, two, the two boxes grouped together that couldn't be combined into fours, and then the three fours. And then you mark off uh, all the terms that these cover. So this covers 0, 1, 8, 9. So you mark those off with X's. This covers uh, 0, 2. Let's see. And I, I did I, uh, I can't remember. Yeah, I guess it's, I don't know why. I, I should, okay, I'm going to pause this and fix this slide. Okay, so, uh, as you, so then you have the prime implicant selection chart. So you have two charts. The development chart where you create all the prime implicants selection chart. You put all the min terms that are required at the top, and then you put your, uh, prime implicants down the side and you mark all you you wherever there's a min term included in this term you mark it with an X so this term has 0 1 8 9 this has 0 2 8 10 this has 2 6 10 14 this has 1 5 this has 5 7 and this has 6 7 all right now you look down each column and you find all the terms where there's a single X and there they are. We have two terms with a single x. That would be uh, min term 14 and min term 9. Now, since there are no other terms which cover these two min terms, uh, there are no other prime implicants covering these two min terms, then it, these, two, these two prime implicants must be in the solution or will be missing uh, min terms 9 and 14. So, so what that means is, uh, we have to have this min term, which means then min term 0, 1, 8 will also be covered. So we basically draw a line, oh, we draw a line through that, 0, 1, 8, 9. So that covers all those. And we also draw a line through this one down here, 2, 6, 10, 14. Now, the vertical lines just eliminate all the other x's in each column because they're now all covered. And then we see what's left. So basically, all the zeros are covered, all the ones are covered, all the twos, all the fives, or sorry, all the sixes, all the eights, and all the tens. Now we look at the chart and we see what is left. What is left is five and seven. So the question then becomes of the remaining min terms that have not been selected, which would be 0, 2, 8, 10. We didn't use that one yet. But all, the, all its terms are covered. 1, 5, well, the 1's covered, but the 5 isn't. 5, 7, yeah, both 5 and 7 are not covered. And then 6, 7, yes, yeah, so the 6 is covered, but the 7 isn't. So what's the best, what's the best set of remaining min terms to cover what's not covered, which is uh, this, 5, 6, this 5, 7? And the answer is, oops, um, I guess that was it. The answer is uh, clearly 5, 7 is the best choice because otherwise we'd have to have 1, 5, 
to cover 5 and 6, 7 to cover 7. So we'd have to have two more terms instead of just one more. So our answer then is 0, 1, 8, 9, 2, 6, 10, 14, and 5, 7. And then we just have to represent those um, in, in, their, in their min term form. And we can go back to the previous chart and do that. Uh, 0, 1, 8, 9, oh, well. 0, 1, 8, 9 then would be um, B prime, C prime. And uh, 2, 6, 10, 14 would be C, D prime. And 5, 7 would be A prime, B, D. And you can just read those off of that. Normally it's good to put, put the, the rest of it here, like... Um, C D prime, for instance, on this one. All right. Anyway, I'm not going to give you. A, I'm not going to ask you about this, so you don't really need to. I just wanted to refresh your memory. And then, uh, if you use it with, if you do Quinney McCluskey with unspecified values, the only difference is you you only put the required min terms up here. But when you build the when you build the first chart, when you build this chart, you do include even the don't cares. And then, so some of the don't cares will appear here in the in the prime implicates formed. And then you, you can tell which how the min, how the don't care should be selected based on what terms appear in your solution. Okay, so that's all there is to this. And then uh, Patrick's method is just a way of, of if you have a lot of terms and you're trying to figure out what the best uh, remaining set of uh, terms is, sometimes you have to form a, a logic expression uh, and then simplify that. But uh, I'm definitely not going to ask you about Patrick's method. All right, so here's our summary of simplification. We, we learned how to do algebraic simplification using the uh, first distributive law, second distributive law, multiplying and factoring, and, the, um, and, and then we learned uh, four simplification theorems. We learned uh, how to combine terms, uh, how to eliminate a term, how to eliminate a literal, and how to uh, use the consensus theorem to also eliminate a term. Um, a K-map is another great way to simplify. It's really best for three, four, or five variables. It's a little hard with six, and after that, it, there are tricks you can use with map-entered variables and some other things, but they only work for certain problems. Um, and I never really taught that anyway, uh, because I, you know, clearly you're going to use computer-based tools. And then the Queenie McCluskey method with uh, Petrick's uh, help, if you have a lot of variables, that might be up to 15 variables in a computerized solution. Um, and then there are other techniques that have been used to develop uh, computer-based tools. All right, so our SOP and POS only give two-level hardware. Sometimes we can expand to one more level, maybe costing us a little bit of time to uh, uh, propagation delay time because of the extra level, but, uh, but sometimes it saves a tremendous amount of hardware and it may be worth doing, depending on how critical the timing is. Um, so, so, uh, and then sometimes we want to look at, um, at other types of gates, uh, using NAND, NOR, AND, and OR in the, uh, eight different two-level networks that we can generate. The most common ones really are the NAND, NAND, and the NOR, NOR. And you should remember that NAND, NAND flows from SOP, NOR, NOR flows from POS. All right, sometimes the minimum expression when you have multiple output functions may not be the best because you may want to share terms. And you need to consider the number of inputs for a gate, how many gates, propagation delays, how many layers, and then how you're going to how you're going to lay these things out on a uh, integrated circuit or uh, how, the, how the layout's going to be done. Um, all right. We talk about functionally complete sets of logic gates so we know that AND OR inverters is sort of the canonical uh, starting point. But you can also do other, uh, there are other uh, complete functional sets. NAND gates by themselves are functionally complete set. So are NOR gates by themselves. And there are several others. Uh, you should definitely know about uh, exclusive OR and exclusive NOR, or sometimes we call that the equivalence gate. It's just the inverse of the NOR gate, uh, sorry, of the exclusive OR gate. So the exclusive NOR is just the inverse of the exclusive OR. You just put an inverter on the output. Um, and there's also even and odd gates, and there's another a number of other things. Um, 
So, uh, okay, uh, and you should know how to convert from one set of gates to the other. Typically, uh, we can use De Morgan's law, and we can do the inverse of the inverse and then partially expand it. Uh, but if you if you have it in SOP form and you want to get to NOR NOR, the first thing you have to do is switch it to POS form and then uh, do the inverse of the inverse, and then you can get to NOR NOR by partial expansion. All right. How do we how do we count uh, the cost of a system? Well, we total number of gates, total number of inputs, and then number of layers affects our propagation time. Also, the quality of the hardware, voltage we're running it at, uh, and then how far apart the actual components are. All those uh, contribute to it. Okay. Okay, sometimes we, uh, we just have to remember multi-layer designs. Um, so, uh, so we usually try, the nets you could look at initially would be or and, and or, and then expand it a little bit and you get and or and, or expand a little bit and you get or and or. Um, so, So the NAND gate um, is just the AND gate with an inverter in the output, and the NOR gate is just an OR gate with an inverter on the output. The way I evaluate these gates, I think to myself, okay, what is the output before the inverter, and then I just invert it. If you try and do it in one step, it's easy to make a mistake. So think before and then after the inverter on the output. All right, so we know that they're only, th these are the eight useful well, because they're functionally complete, uh, the eight uh, two-level networks that you can get out of R, N, NOR, and NAND. And they are AND, R, so that starting with SOP, AND, R, that's SOP form. Partially expand, you get NAND, NAND. A little more, you get R, NAND, and finally NOR, OR. Then, then you can start in POS form with R, AND, and uh, do the double inversion, partially expand it, and you get NOR, NOR, and then expand a little more, you get and nor, and a little more, you get nan and. Notice that there are uh, eight other possible types, but that they are not functionally complete. Um, okay, and, and remember, you you can only go down the, uh, either start in and or form and go nan nand or nand nor or, or you start in POS form or and form, and you go nor nor and nor and nand and. And here's the classic chart from the book. Start up here in SOP, and you work your way around. And if you keep going, you'll go back to where you started when you fully expand the double inversion. And of course, that makes sense. If you take if you take X and you invert it once and then invert it again, you get right back to X. Okay. And every single one of these functions gives you the exact same result for F. So they're all equivalent. And really, I don't know that the and nor, the nand and, the or nand, and the nor or forms are used very much, but the nand nand and the nor nor are used a lot. Okay, we can also do this graphically, and we can just substitute symbols. Now, again, you if you want to get to nand nand, you can't start from or and form. You, you have to first convert that to... Uh, and or, and then you can get the NAND NAND uh, by just substituting gates. The conversion from from SOP to POS and vice versa pretty much has to be done through switching algebra. I don't think you can do that by switching gates, or if you can, it's it's so complicated. I, I, it's a little hard for me to figure out. But these are equivalent. So an AND gate is just an OR gate with inverters on all the inputs and the output, and an OR gate can be thought of as just an AND gate with inverters on all the inputs and the output. A NAND and a NOR are just the opposite gate with inverters only on the inputs, but no output. No output, uh, uh, no output functions. All right. Uh, let's see. So you can you can uh, you can substitute these symbols for the gates directly. And the other thing to remember is that you can always add two bubbles, 
and you can always slide bubbles along a wire and two bubbles will cancel each other so you can add two bubbles and you can take let two bubbles on the same wire slide together and cancel and um, yeah okay so adding layers sometimes you can save gates by partial factoring or partial multiplying out in this particular case we have uh, F equals AB plus AC plus AD. You can factor out the A and you can definitely save a gate. And here's the example. We have A and the output of B ended with or ended with, uh, sorry, B or, or with C or with D uh, fed into the AND gate. So this would be without doing a little bit of factoring and here it is. All right. Uh, in this case, it did not add a layer. But um, but in uh, but sometimes it does add a layer, but it didn't in this case. Okay, and then we have several output functions. Uh, when you when you have several output functions, then you have to think about how to how to share terms essentially. And you all did this in your in your group design projects pretty much. And the way you do that, you basically identify the essential prime implicants, and then you see what you can use. Uh, between different uh, different functions that where there's overlapping terms. Um, okay, um, like here. So this is three functions, and uh, it's pretty easy to see that we have this piece here and this piece here, which we need for separate outputs. But you can just com combine those two pieces, and you get this piece here. Uh, and you can see we definitely can share this term, but you could even do uh, you could use two terms for this term, and then you could you could use uh, you could use you could use one of those uh, for this term. So there are different things you can do. But anyway, uh, basically just looking to see how best you can share terms. In this case, the CD term, which is this one, uh, no, that's the AB term. The CD term is this one. So this one has a CD term, but you could shorten that up. You can make it A prime CD and A CD. And so uh, using the same gate for AB saves, and then you can also replace CD with those two gates. And uh, that'll, that, that, that can also save another gate. Okay. Yeah, sometimes the best solution uh, may not be the obvious one, so you have to look at it a little bit. Um, okay, there's a majority and minority gate, so these are two other types of gates. Here's the three input, uh, and this is the column for majority, this is the column for minority. And fan in. So sometimes you can only have, there is a maximum number of inputs you can have to a gate, so when you exceed that, then you then you're going to have to split it up, and you you just have to remember for AND gates it's easy for OR gates it's easy for, for NAND and NORs you have to worry about the inverter, and so then that 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 does cause some problems. Um, takes the extra layer. All right, uh, here we have um, timing diagrams, and you do have to think about these. So this is an inverter, and what you can see from this is when the uh, when the when the X changes goes from low to high, then the X prime should go from high to low. But it does take a little bit of delay time, that's E1. And then when you go the other way, when X falls, then it takes a little bit of time for the output to rise, and that's E2. Notice that E1 and E2 may not necessarily be equal. There, there's often asymmetry in the way the gates respond. So you just have to factor that in. And uh, we also have, with clock edges, we have to worry about data setup time, data hold time. Um, so hazards, what are hazards? Hazards are when we have a change uh, in, a, in a variable that should stay at 1 or should stay at 0, but instead it may, it may glitch, glitch down or glitch up for just a short time because of uh, delays in some of the paths. So this would look like a static one hot hazard. It should have stayed up, but it glitched down just for a little bit of time. And here's a static zero hazard. Glitches up to one, should have stayed low. And then dynamic hazards kind of look like the little bouncing switch thing. 
where it you get a glitch and then finally it goes up and stays up for good. So here's an example of a hazard. Uh, we have uh, delays associated with all these gates and the B value uh, changes. So let's say C is 1 and A is 1, but B starts off as 1, but then switches to 0. Well, when B switches to 0, uh, when B is a 1 and C is a 1, this AND gate will conduct, and D will be a 1 and F will be a 1. But because B is a 1, the, the, the input here will be a 0, therefore G will be a 0, and so the only thing driving F would be D. But let's say, for sake of argument, your B changed from 0 to 1. It really shouldn't matter. F should still stay a, should still be a 1. But what happens is when, F, when 1 goes to 0, this gate stops sending out a 1 immediately or soon. This gate has to wait for the inverter to flip the B from a, uh, the output of this gate from a 1 to a 0. When that finally gets to a 0, then this G falls to 0. And that could cause F to glitch down and then back up, just like here. So that's, and the way to fix that is to include the consensus term in here. And there is a consensus term. All right. Um, we can do K maps. Uh, let's see. But here's where you can really see, again, it's a consensus term. So this is, so to solve this map, uh, we would obviously need the two red terms. We don't really need the green one. But if you switched from this square to this square, or vice versa, you could have a uh, you could have a problem with um, uh, with a with a hazard. But if you add in that green consensus term, then then you'll eliminate the hazard. But of course, that is another gate. All right. Now, um, I put my face back up, I should have. All right, so now we have, um, we don't probably need this. So VHDL, we're not gonna really worry about this, but um, uh, in Verilog, we only have four values for our bits. And uh, in, in, in VHDL, there's actually nine in the, in the IEEE standard, but we only really concern ourselves with five. And remember they have so zero and one, obviously, uninitialized, unknown, and uh, high Z. They differentiate between uninitialized and unknown. But in Verilog, we don't. We just have an X, whether it's uninitialized or unknown. Now, interestingly, wires, when, we have an, when we're not driving the wire, it's going to be in a high Z state, disconnected. But a register, if we create a register and we don't uh, preload it with something, then it's it's always going to come up as an X because it it will have a value we just don't know what it is and we can actually set up um, we can actually set up uh, truth tables with these values right here using just the four zero one high Z and unknown and you can see uh, this is an AND gate here's an OR gate and you can see uh, in many cases we can still even with an unknown or a high Z input we can still we still know what the output's going to be in some of these cases, but not all of them. All right. Uh, test pattern generation. So uh, if you only have a few inputs, you can often exhaustively test something. But when you have a large number of inputs, typically that, that uh, and, and also especially if, it's, if you have a lot of states involved too, you can, you can definitely get a very, very, uh, you can have so many possibilities that you cannot, uh, test them all. So what you do in that case uh, is you uh, then you try and pick you try and pick uh, good test patterns uh, to do this. And we're going to cover this in uh, DSD. We'll talk a little bit about uh, how you test stuck at uh, and how you pick good test patterns. But this is actually a subject all in itself. It's a, it's maybe even a whole course. So uh, we won't really cover it exhaustively. Uh, all right, we've already studied multiplexers. You should be familiar with this. Uh, this is a four to one, two control lines, four inputs and output. And, and here's, the, here's the defining equation. Here's the logic diagram for it. 
and um, here's a two to one, a four to one, an eight to one. They're defining equations. Now, you can implement with a four to one mux, you can implement any three variable problem. Remember how you do this? You divide the truth table into groups, uh, into pairs of rows. And then you know for each pair of rows that the A and the B uh, selectors are the same. But so you put A into to the higher order selector and B into the lower order. And then what you do is you look at, see what for each pair of rows, what the desired values of F are. There's four possibilities. F can be zero for both rows, one for both rows, one zero or zero one. And so if it's, if it's zero for both rows, you just put a zero in. If it's one for both rows, you put a one in. If it's zero one, that would just be C because that's what C does. So you just put in C, but if it's one zero, it's the opposite of C. So you put in C, C prime or C bar. Uh, three state buffers. These are really important things. Um, these get used extensively. These buffers, uh, they're like regular buffers, um, but they also have an additional control line that, that puts the buffer in a high Z or disconnected state. This is essential for driving buses because when you, uh, out, when you have outputs that are connected to buses, but the bus is uh, able to receive outputs from several devices, you don't want two devices sending a value to the bus at the same time. It could be an 8-bit or a 16-bit or a 32-bit bus or even more. You only want one device at a time. So you want to deactivate or disconnect all the other outputs connecting to each of those bus lines. And you do that with, with a three-state buffer or tri-state buffer. And they come in four different flavors, inverting and non-inverting, active high and active low. And that's how, that's how you generally try and uh, work it out. Okay, um, and here are the truth tables for that. Uh, decoders. Decoders, um, they're still used extensively, but now they're usually uh, implemented on a large um, chip uh, that's maybe specially designed for a motherboard or something. In the old days, the motherboards had a whole bunch of these individual 74138s on them, which were used to decode all the, all the address lines. And basically, you have three inputs, and they select one of these outputs to be high as long as the chip is enabled. The chip, If the chip's not enabled, then, then they're all going to be low. But if the chip uh, is enabled, then one of these outputs, as determined by the three inputs, will be, uh, will be a, a one. So basically, the chip enabled then becomes the data in, and the, imp and the three inputs, A, B, C, are the select lines. So it can be a three a three to eight line uh, encoder or decoder. Well, I'm sorry. Typically, um, it it's typically decodes, but most of the time those are used uh, for decoding address lines. And this is what it looks like. You have the three inputs. So for all eight possibilities of the three inputs, one of the outputs will be hot and all the others cold. Now you can you can implement any any uh, so if you have a three to eight decoder you can implement any three variable function. All you have to do is or together is select the min terms you want and or them together. But you do have to add an external or gate with enough inputs. Read only memories. You can also implement uh, combinational designs with read only memories. Okay, so let's see. Yeah. So read-only memories. Um, so we'll talk about these a little more in this course. So, so I don't I don't need to spend a lot, a lot of the time uh, as part of the review of logic design. But basically, ROMs are real important, and uh, I definitely want you all to know how to size them and to be uh, aware of the different types. Um, you know, in the old days, they were pretty much programmed. Um, well, you could program you could program out a factory with a mask, or you could have them. Uh, you could uh, blow diodes by uh, by putting in too much energy, and and then and and it, but it was irreversible. So once you programmed them, that was it. They were programmed, and you were done. Uh, 
but then they came up with this way to erase them using ultraviolet light uh, and uh, and you put a little sticker over the window uh, that that usually they put a little uh, mica window in so you could look through the window and see the actual chip and you could expose it to ultraviolet light which would allow the uh, the charge to leak off uh, uh, out of the cells and that would actually set them all to ones um, and then you program them by writing a charge into the cell now some of them didn't have windows so they were one time programmable but if they had a window you could expose the, the window to uh, to ultraviolet light and uh, you could erase them and reprogram them and uh, yeah they, that was very common and I I basically made myself my own programmer you had to have a little, uh, I don't know, I think a 50 millisecond pulse of 24 volts or something. Um, although the chip normally ran on 5 volts. And then you could write, uh, you could put the whatever you wanted programmed into each word. And uh, then apply the address, put in the bits you wanted. And then pulse the, uh, the little programming line. And you would program it. And then you could erase it by putting it in a little ultraviolet, ultraviolet uh, under an ultraviolet lamp and a little box. And in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes, it would erase it. But now we have the ability to electrically write and erase. And, and, uh, and that's called EEPROM, electrically erasable, electrically programmable, read-only memory. Uh, but, uh, and then we have the, the flash version of EEPROM, which is a special type of EEPROM that's more dense. Uh, and this is what is used in jump drives and in, and in most of our... Uh, microprocessor, our programmable memory, that's what's used. The main difference between flash and standard EEPROM is that uh, EEPROM can often erase one location at a time, although not when it's ultraviolet erased. You have to erase the whole chip. But, uh, but with the electrically writable, electrically erasable EEPROM, you can typically erase a single location and reprogram it. Um, with flash, you typically have to erase a group of cells. Sometimes, uh, you know, it, eight or nine or ten or maybe a larger section it depends on how it's made and and this that's partly how it gets greater density um, but it's just a variation of EEPROM all right so the way a flash is set up you you have a uh, you have your uh, you have your uh, address lines that come into a decoder and it's basically an end to two to the n uh, decoder just like a three to eight well this would be an n to two to the n and uh, when you put in a given address one of these lines will light up and will uh, uh, turn on one of the words that's in the memory which will then show up on the output lines so um, there are some definite advantages to designing with ROMs uh, and it's especially useful when you have uh, uh, where there's very little product terms that are shared and where you can't really uh, do much to minimize the uh, the solution. Um, this this would come into play like with a keyword keyboard where you punch a key and you get say a, a, a you get an 8-bit byte that comes out. So in a 128 um, keyboard with you know shifts and control lines. Uh, you have uh, you you pretty much have every one of the 256 uh, possibilities in eight bits covered, and um, and and so uh, so a ROM is a good way to do this uh, because uh, and then your address lines are just made up of the keys and uh, and maybe the shift line is one of the address lines the control line might be another one and then the keys are are sort of decoded into a little matrix. And um, sometimes, uh, if we're not using read-only memories, then we might use uh, programmable logic. Now, these days, programmable logic has kind of been replaced by, by either uh, CPLDs, which stands for Complex Programmable Logic Devices, or Field Prime Programmable Gate Arrays, uh, FPGAs. Uh, and they're pretty big devices. The, uh, the, the little small programmable logic devices are kind of not used so much anymore uh, because we'll probably use a CPLD instead because they're probably about the same cost. Um, 
So a lot of these earlier things are just no longer around. Um, but the way the the way the programmable logics, uh, the PA programmable array logics and programmable logic arrays went, you you typically had a a set of inputs and a dense array of AND gates which you could select any of the inputs are their inverts to go to, and then you had an output set of OR gates that you could program. So you could program the input AND gates to generate a whole bunch of product terms, and then you could connect those product terms to several different output OR gates to generate different functions. And um, and usually you would then have to, you did want to minimize and simplify your, your, uh, your truth table so that you could fit it into these uh, PALs. A, a, uh, a, so in the, in the PAL, the output array was fixed. It wasn't programmable. But in the PLA, you could program both. And that was the difference. I, I'm not going to test you on that. I don't really, I think that's just really no longer too relevant. But here's some of the, here's some of the, 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 the programmable array logic chips that used to exist. And these were, these were used for glue logic when you had to, um, when you had to, to interface um, s buses or some, or some c chips, uh, you could use these to, to connect things. And uh, now we have, uh, many of our microprocessors have the ability to, to have uh, programmable logic uh, uh, modules uh, where you can actually do this inside your microprocessor chip unrelated to um, unrelated to the uh, to the core we call them core independent blocks um, all right as these chips got bigger and bigger they turned into uh, complex programmable logic devices or field programmable gate arrays and this is a CPLD and these come in different sizes Xilinx makes a bunch of them but um, and these can be very useful uh, for uh, for essentially replacing um, the old programmable logic arrays, and these are programmed with hardware description language. The the the, the old PALs, these things were programmed with special uh, languages that each manufacturer would make up, and their own. You know, they'd have this personality matrix or whatever, and uh, they were somewhat complicated to get programmed. Uh, but now they all just work on uh, on uh, hardware description language. And again, obviously, field programmable gate arrays. We're going to talk extensively about this in the course, so I'm not going to spend any time on this. Shannon's expansion. Uh, we're going to talk about this in the course, too. But basically, Shannon's expansion, you can break any five-value function into two four-variable functions simply by factoring out one of the variables. And, um, and then one of your four-variable functions is based on that variable being uh, one, and one of the other four-variable functions is based on that variable being zero. And this is a way to divide a five-variable function and fit it into two uh, four-variable four lookup tables, for instance. On our chip, we have six-variable lookup tables. So if you had a seven-variable function, you could, you could do Shannon's uh, decomposition, and you could uh, uh, use two LUT6s to implement a LUT7. And that's how this works. Um, let's see. Uh, then flip-flop. So we've talked about... Uh, so flip-flops are basically our memory element. Uh, and they, they sort of come in, you can think of them as sort of four different variations. You can have a, an RS latch that doesn't really have a clock. Uh, you can think of, uh, a, of a uh, JK flip-flop that does have an edge trigger clock. And then, and, and then, you, can, uh, and then you can configure the JK flip-flop to be a D flip-flop or a T flip-flop. And um, you should know how to do this. So the basic set reset latch uh, is set up like this. It's two NOR gates with their outputs connected back to another R to another NOR gate in this manner. And uh, it has two stable states: one where um, one where Q is one and Q prime is zero, and one where Q is one and Q prime. Uh, Q is zero and Q prime is one. So those are the two stable states. In this particular latch, we do not let S and R be one at the same time because when then one of them changes, it 
if they both change to zero simultaneously, it would be somewhat unpredictable what state it would wind up in. And when they're both one, it forces Q and Q prime to uh, both be zeros, which shouldn't be because they should always be the opposite of each other. Then we have a gated D latch where we have a gate. When the gates open, the latch responds to D. And when the gates close, it holds whatever the last value of D was. And then we have a clock T flip-flop. Normally our clock T flip-flops are set up as master-slave so that our clock is a, not a level clock, but it's an edge clock. And, um, and this is what the master-slave JK flip-flop is. And uh, you should know, uh, you, should, you should go back and review the classic equation, but an easy way to keep track of how this works is J sets, K clears. If they're both one, it toggles. If they're both zero, it holds. And here, here are the four different flip-flops. Remember, T's really don't exist. And T's are where you, uh, where you combine both the J and the K inputs together. Uh, if, it's, if they're both zero, then it holds. If they're both one, it's going to toggle. So the T is sort of a toggle flip-flop. The D, you, you invert the input into one, and that's how you get the, the D. All right. Remember that our, uh, our our sequential logic always has to have some memory element, and usually we use flip-flops almost exclusively. Um, in in DSD, our if we simply every time we declare a register, we're essentially making flip-flops. And our all of our flip-flops have uh, have timing considerations. If this is your clock, uh, the the clock has to stay up for a certain amount of time. It has to, it, the data has to be there so many nanoseconds before the edge so, and has to hold so many nanoseconds after the edge. And the rise and fall times, again, they're often not symmetric. Here the rise time is, you know, typical uh, 25 nan or typical 13 nanoseconds, maximum 25. And here, uh, typical 25 fall time, maximum 40. So it, it can have a, a much longer fall time than a rise time. Uh, they come in, mostly they come in edge triggered. Uh, it's really rare to have uh, level triggered flip-flops um, and they're mostly all edge triggered and they can be rising edge or falling edge triggered. Uh, our tri-state buffers again are what allow us to connect multiple things to buses where we don't want two things connected at the same time. Uh, okay, the three-digit counter. So this is the homework problem for this week uh, had to do with this. Um, and uh, so the sequential, the sequential counter is rather easy. Uh, we, don't have, we don't really have an input for this problem, but here's our state table. Okay, so it's really, uh, it's not, it's not a, uh, it's this sequential truth table, but it's really a state table. Our present state for our three flip-flops, ABC, and the next state. And then if we want to drive it with T's, we have to generate additional columns where we set the T input to be what it needs. So if, if it's going to hold the same value, the T should be 0. If it's toggling from 0, 1, or from 1 to 0, either way, the input should be a 1. In this case, the C flip-flop toggles on every clock, so the input's always 1. So that one's just tied, to, tied, tied high. And then... Uh, then we can do an equation for the TB input and for the TA input. And there's our map for TA, it equals BC. And here our map for TB, it equals just C. And so, uh, so here's how you would connect it up. Now this one, they, they, they didn't want to talk about a clock for this. They did this pulse thing, but really here it is with a clock. This is how it really should be. And with a clock, uh, it's pretty straightforward. TC is tied high. Uh, TB is just the C output. And uh, TA gets uh, C and B. And when they're both true, then TA is going to be a 1 and it'll toggle. All right. Here's our state graph for our sequential counter 0 to, five, to 7 and back to 0. And then uh, we just, uh, and, and, and here's the circuit. And, you, and here are the, the we did the truth table. We did the, this. Just the state graph. All right. What if we're going to do a non-continuous sequence? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, so let me let me just work that uh, let me just work that briefly, 
as kind of the final thing here. Let me get this set up real quick. And uh, okay, and what I'm going to do then. Okay, so I'm going to um, switch myself here. I'll expand me, and I'll switch to the uh, other camera, and I'll, I'll talk you through this. Okay, so so let's say we want to do a sequence. Um, let's say we want to do a sequence, uh, three-bit sequence. We'll do three, four, seven, zero, five. Okay. So we, we create our state table, our present state, and our next state. And we have uh, three flip-flops, A, B, and C. And then these are going to be A+, plus, B+, plus, C+. Plus. We're going to use D flip-flops, so we're not going to have to have any extra columns. We'll be able to use these columns. And we, we then we're going to populate it with um, all the possibilities. So this would be... Zero, well, I'm going to do the A first. Zero, 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 one, 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 one. And then zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one. And then this is going to be zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And I'm going to do it in pairs of two rows to keep, so we can keep it straight. Okay, now, uh, our desired next state then we have to go back to our sequence so so from 0 we go to 5 right here from 1 uh, doesn't appear so it's don't cares 2 doesn't appear so it's don't cares 3 goes to 4 4 goes to 7, 7 goes to 0, and, uh, uh, sorry, I did that wrong, 4 goes to 7, 5 goes to uh, 3, I did that wrong, I put in zeros. Okay, so 5 goes to 3. Uh, 6 doesn't exist, so it's a don't care. And 7 goes to 0. All right, that's everything. So remember, we order this in straight binary order, so it's easier to put it into the K maps. So let's, now let's do our K maps over here. So we're going to have a K map. For, for all three, so um, three variable k-maps. Okay. Oh, man, that's terrible. Maybe I'll try and fix this. All right. I don't know why this is so bad. It's a large eraser. Should be easy. Okay, then let me get this one fixed up. All right. Oh, that's about as bad as it was. All right. So let's do the A. So the A one don't care don't care one, one don't care don't care. Oh sorry, don't care. One, don't care, don't care, one. And then one, zero, don't care, zero. One, zero, don't care, zero. So we'll leave the zeros blank. And then B was zero, don't care, don't care, zero. So zero, don't care, don't care, zero. And one, one, 
don't care, zero. One, one, don't care, zero. And then C, let's see if I can fit a C in here. C was one, don't care, don't care, zero. One, don't care, don't care, zero. And zero, uh, sorry, one, one, don't care, zero. One, one, don't care, zero. All right, so pretty obvious. That's a good solution here. That's a good solution here. And this and this is a good solution there. So this would just be, if it's ABC, this would just be uh, uh, B prime. This would be uh, A, B prime. And this would be uh, A prime. And that would be uh, C prime. So then the solution then, uh, so so uh, the 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 d sub a would be equal. <coughs> excuse me, would equal uh, a prime c prime. The d sub b would equal a b prime, and the uh, the d c would equal uh, B prime. So, so your circuit then would have the flip-flop set up like this. A, B, and C. And uh, so the so we'd have a, a Q and a Q prime, or well, a B and a B prime output, a C and a C prime, this really should have been A and A prime, and a D input. And then we'd all have a clock. Okay, so the, the, the A input is A prime, C prime. So we take the A prime, and we have an OR gate here, and it would go into the D input and C prime would go in there too. The B, uh, the C would just be B prime, and the B would be an AND gate with A and B prime. With A and B prime. And that would be that would be that. Then every tick of the clock, once it got into the proper sequence, it should go in the specified order. Now, unless you preload it with the with a starting sequence, you do have to do a little work to make sure that if it fire, fires up in one or two or six, that it doesn't somehow stay in in some other loop and never get to the proper count sequence. Uh, because again, when you power this up these are going to assume random values. So you could put clears on them and you could have a capacitor pulling all the clears low initially and then as the capacitor charged up uh, it would pull them high and then the count would begin. And then it would start in, in a known uh, sequence of, uh, of starting with zero. Alright so that's, that's that. So I think I'm going to stop here uh, and we'll continue to uh, work on um, we continue to work on these uh, on these uh, issues then uh, uh, next week or, or on Friday. We'll continue on Friday, and again a week from today we'll do the logic design test. All right.